Right. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm Andrew Godwin, and I'm going to give you a talk um, on Django's architecture, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, I'll cover exactly what that means in a short, few short moments. But first of all, just an in introduction to myself. Um, I'm one of the Django core committers. I have been working with Django for about three years. I became a core, core committer last year. Um, I am at various times either a freelance or mercenary programmer, as I like to call myself. Um, and also, at the moment, I'm sort of founding a startup, apparently. Uh, it's more a project that evolved. Um, so, first of all, I want to start off with a brief history of Django, how it's evolved, where it's come from, um, if you're unfamiliar, which a lot of people are. So, Django um, started off at the Launch Journal World in Lawrence, Kansas, in 2005. Um, a team of three developers and one designer um, sort of built Django internally for use with a few sort of sites the, the World Company was building. Um, they were a very newspaper site, they were quite CMS-y, um, but it was still quite a generic framework. And so they decided to public re publicly release it um, the same year, and so they weren't expecting much reaction, but the sort of reaction they got overwhelmed them. The oft-famous quote is that in 2006, Jacob, um, one of the first few developers on Django, um, famously quoted that Django 1.0 is just around the corner. Um, a mere two years later, they finally got to 1.0 after rewriting about half the code base. Um, since 1.0, we've had a basically an API feature freeze or at least backwards compatibility. So any feature we want to get rid of has to have at least three versions of deprecation. So it's quite stable now. Before 1.0, it was anything goes. A lot of people were running off of the main branch of SV subversion for quite a while. Um, I think about, there was about one and a half years between stable releases at one point, and there were many, many production sites just running off of the development branch. So it's nice we finally have some stable releases again. Um, release 1.3 is coming up in a few weeks. Uh, it's more of a minor bug fix release this time. Um, since 1.0, we've added a few big features. 1.3 is a little less, but we still snuck some f sort of major features in. But generally, it's sort of progressing nice, nice and stably these days. So one of the main things about architecture is how things are architected. Um, so first of all, I'm going to go through how Django is basically laid out in the, co in the code base. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Python, it should be pretty obvious how things work. Um, there's modules, it's like most other languages, they're hierarchical. Um, and then after that, I'm going to go through some of the more interesting points um, of the Django code base in architecture. Some of them are good, some of them used to be bad and fixed them, and some of them are still a bit ugly, and we're going to try and fix them soon. So Django is, as you can imagine for a large web framework, a very complex beast. This is a subset of the top-level modules in Django. Um, these are the main important ones, though. Uh, so going through them uh, alphabetically, contrib is where we keep all of our optional add-ons. So Django's philosophy is that anything that doesn't have to be in the core is in contrib. You can, you can disable it. So user authentication, sessions, all that kind of stuff are in there. I'll go over that in more detail in a second. Core is where all the absolutely essential part of Django is, things like URL resolving, basic functions and handlers. DB is our model's backend for calling to databases. It's an abstraction layer. Um, I'll go over that again in a, minute, in a minute. Dispatch is the signal handlers. So Django has um, signals, which are sort of, you know, you can register hooks into signals. So, so you can say, when this model is changed, um, do run this function. So you can do custom save hooks, custom validation, things like that, in sort of what, that kind of area. HTTP is our HTTP handling libraries. It does things like recognizing status codes, performing correct responses, MIME handling, that kind of stuff. Forms is the forms library. Django has had two forms libraries, one called old forms now, one called new forms. This is new forms in 1.3. Um, forms is a sort of generic way of writing user input forms. Um, so both simple forms like name, email, password, and more complex sets of, there are at least three sets of name, email, password. They all have to be present. That has to be mo at most five. It's quite, you get quite complex. Middleware is where what Django calls middleware lives. If you're unfamiliar with the concept from Whiskey, then it's basically um, code that runs around a request. So you can intercept the incoming HTTP request and set custom variables. You can change the headers. So you can do authentication. You can do CSRF protection. And then on the response, you can do things. So you can gzip, for example, on the response. 
you can do various things like that. Shortcuts is full of some handy bits um, because Django can get very complex in its import paths. So there's things in there for sort of just render me a this template into a response and things like that. Um, templates is where the Django templating language lives. Um, the Django templating language is quite an odd beast. It's designed mostly so that you can't do much logic in it. Um, for a very long time, it was designed very much this way. We're slowly sort of weaning off of that um, at the moment. And it's, uh, I'll come on to that later, it's quite interesting and it's probably one of the oldest parts of the code base that hasn't been touched very much. And then finally, views, which is where all our generic views live. Um, and in the latest release of Django, we've introduced something called um, class-based views, which are sort of a better framework for running views and all that code lives in there. So contrib is, as you can see, even more uh, in-depth than the main level three. So these are, these are the main contrib apps, there's about six more of them. Um, I'll go through some of the more interesting ones later with some pictures of how they work, but admin is Django's famous magical administrator interface where you can edit code. Auth is our user authentication system, the subject of much debate. It works very well out of the box for small applications. Comments is a bit of an odd commenting system that was great when it was invented and is getting a bit out of date now. Um, content types is a way of doing generic foreign keys to other things, so you can link to arbitrary tables and models. Um, it, kind of, it kind of breaks relational database conventions a bit, but it can be very useful for things like comments, which it lives next to. Flat pages is a very simple way of just having database pages, so you can say things like an about page and an FAQ page, you can just have them. It's, again, not very complex. Um, the idea of Contrib is it's very simple Implementations are very common patterns. That's the definition of it. Um, Giz is one of the more interesting ones. It's Django's geospatial support. So you can do arbitrary polygons. You can do testing of lines in lines. You can do projections. You can do all sorts of exciting things. Um, I've got some stuff on that later as well. Humanize is full of things for outputting numbers and sizes humanely to users. So you can do things like putting commas in numbers, changing numbers to words. Local flavor is full of things that are for localization as opposed to internationalization. So for those that don't know the difference, internationalization is translating um, words. So you can, for example, rather than saying hello Andrew, you can have bonjour Andrew. Um, local flavor is different to that in that it's localizing what you put in. So in the UK, we'd have a postcode. In the US, you have a zip code. Um, also, things like telephone numbers vary from country to country. And there's other things as well. So things like the US state fields are in there because they're only important for the US. And so most large countries have an entry in local flavor with some custom widgets for their country. So if you're building an application for you know, something that isn't based on either the UK or America, which a lot of people do here in Europe, um, you can actually do it sanely, which is helpful. Messages is a way of doing um, sort of messages for upcoming things. So I think in Rails they call this flash, but the idea is you could, so you can save somebody, say, tell them it's been saved, and then the next page along can look at the messages and go, oh look, it's been saved. Sessions is our support for sessions, because obviously HTTP is stateless. So that just has cookies and it stores things in another database or a cache backend. Static files is new in 1.3. Um, Django used to just tell you to do your own management of CSS and images and things. Uh, these days we've decided to move in in this release, support for managing, the, managing those more sanely. So the idea with Django is that you can have these third-party reusable apps, and it used to be the case that you had to take their media they shipped with, their CSS, their JavaScript, and move it into the right place. With static files, Django will automatically, automatically take all of that media and put it in the right place for you. And also there's syndication, which is our support for RSS, Atom, and those other kind of feeds. Um, core itself has a few other things inside it, um, namely there's the cache, which is our cache backend. Um, the cache backend is somewhat abstracted, I'll talk about that in a bit. There's files, which is support for uploading files and handling on disk files. Um, there's various optimizations there, so small files only ever get stored in memory, and large files get pushed onto the disk when they're uploaded, so you don't use up all the memory of like a gig file being uploaded. Handlers is full of support for things like talking to ModWhiskey, talking to ModPython, all the various ways you can run Django. Um, I believe there's also uh, fast CGI support in there as well. Mail is the 
um, sort of abstraction layer for emailing people. Um, it used to be fixed. These days, you can have emailing support for SMTP. You have one that prints the console, so you can debug and see what, what would be sent. Um, and there's a few other things in there as well. Management is support for Django's idea of management commands. So managed commands are things where you basically you can say this is a task that people can run. So you can say, you know, so I'll import data or that kind of stuff. And you can define these per application in Django. So if I ship, so for example, I write an application called South, which does database migrations for Django. So I can ship lots of management commands, which do things like run migrations, let you sort of half create migrations automatically. And those are all done by management commands. And the, the framework for one of those lives in there. Serializers is our support for reading and writing out JSON and XML and one other format, I forget what it is, um, for models. So rather than dumping SQL, you can dump a database independent format. It's not particularly efficient and it will fail on large databases, but for moving stuff around in development, when often you're using perhaps SQLite on one machine or Postgres on another, it can be very handy. Servers is where the implementations of the two actual web servers Django has in it are. So there's a very small debugging web server, so you don't have to have like Apache or Mod Python or Granny Corners locally. And there's also a fast CGI wrapper in there which counts as a server. Paginator, for some reason, lives in here. Um, I'm not quite sure why it does. Um, but that supports basically taking a list of things and having pages of it, which is obviously used a lot in most websites. URL resolvers is our URL framework. Um, in Django, URLs are a set of red regular expressions. It reads through them top to bottom, and then the first one that matches, it takes and fires the view connected to that. Um, and then validators is new in 1.2. We have model validation. So what we used to do is just have forms validate input, and then when you try to save something, the database would just die if it's the wrong kind of type. So if you, sort of, if, if you incorrectly had a character field on your form and you saved to an integer field, then it would about the database would just die horrific, horrifically and go, no, that's wrong. In 1.2, we introduced the idea of model validation. So now models also validate things when you put them in, and you get sensible errors rather than the occasionally cryptic MySQL or Postgres errors, um, which can often be quite confusing. The database backend is split into essentially two parts, backends and models. Backends is where all our database-specific code lives. So there's backends for MySQL, Postgres, Oracle, and SQLite in core. And there's also um, Microsoft SQL Server, Firebird, and a few other ones available as third-party applications. They don't have to live in here. This is just the ones we ship with. Um, and then models is the sort of the layer goes on top of that. So backends gets rid of all the specific stuff like what types to use. And models is a sort of um, so in Python we have meta classes and things so you can do things declaratively. And that's where all that magic lives. It's not as magic as it sounds. There's many other parts. I could spend all day going about all, every model, module we have in our code base, um, but for your sanity, I'll, I won't. Uh, so here's a few interesting ones. Um, we have decorators for views. So if you're unfamiliar with Python, again, decorators are the concept of a function which wraps a function. So basically, because in Python, functions are first-class objects, you can take a function, mutate it through a different function, get a different function in return. They get complex. Um, but the idea is you can wrap a function in, this must be done by an admin, this must be done by a logged-in user, or various other checks like that. And some common ones live in there. Generic views contains some simple views. So a lot of sites do things like render a simple template, render a model to a template, render lists of models. And there's common code for all those kind of things that lives in generic views. So you can take them so of your generic site and just pull it over there and have all that code written for you. CSRF is our cross-site request forgery protection. Um, cross-site request forgery is one of those attacks vectors on websites that isn't very well understood. It's very important and it can mean your users can get very nasty things done to them. Django ships with full support for CSRF. We have done for a long time. Um, and I'll cover that again later in a bit. Um, that's been upgraded recently to be less evil than it used to be. Test is a testing framework, which is very important. Um, you can do testing. There's custom test handlers. Um, you can, there's a custom test client where you can do fake requests to Django. And you can do things like assert that a template's been used and look in the context of templates and things like that. Um, there's also the forms, which forms is arranged into the idea of widgets. So a widget could be a text area or a select box. Fields, which then use one of those. They have types. So, for example, if you had an integer field, it would use a text area or could use a text input. Um, you can have multi-select fields and things like that. 
Uh, form sets, which is this idea of having many things, so you can have you know, up to four users, or you can edit a list of things, um, and models, which is our support for introspecting models and making forms automatically out of them. So if you have a model, we can read the field types and work out what it is. But basically, since 2005, literally every piece of code in Django has been changed. There's very little left from the original release that hasn't been touched by somebody. Um, in some places, this is because the original code was a bit odd. In other places, this is because requirements have changed over time. And in other places, it's because we've just expanded on what things can do. But I've, the main crux of this talk is to go through what I think some of the good bits of Django are, some of the bad bits, and some of the really horrible bits that just should never have been in there in the first place. And also, as I said before, some of these are, from, are historical, and we've fixed them, but I get to talk about them here because we've fixed them, and I can sort of gloat. Um, other, other ones of these are current issues in Django that we have yet to fix because we don't have infinite time and infinite developers. Uh, yeah, there we are. Um, the nasty bits, I promise, will be fixed soon. You know, just don't attack me. So, the good things. The main crowd pleaser in Django is the admin. Um, a lot of people, when they first come to Django, the idea they can write about 20 lines of code for a model add two or three lines to an admin, hit go, and then this big page appears that lets you e edit things straight away. That's very handy. Um, the admin is often not used as is on end user sites, although it is a lot of the time. But even in development, it can be a lifesaver because you can, you, know, you can edit your test data, you can do all that kind of stuff really easily without having to fiddle around in a SQL console or a Python shell. Um, I can't tell you how many hours or days the admin has saved me over the past three or four years working with Django, um, just being able to f visually edit and fiddle with my models. And also, a lot of um, clients are quite happy with the admin it provides. It's quite sensible, it's quite clean, it doesn't do very much, but there's lots of extensions for it. The model layer. Um, this is often, often derided part of Django. Um, people often say, well, there's lots of other you know, abstraction layers for Python for databases. There's, there was SQL object, um, it's not so much anymore. There's SQL alchemy, there's lots of others. Um, but Django has a different philosophy. First of all, we call it the model layer. It's not an ORM. Um, it's not specifically designed to deal with relational databases. And there is partial support for things like MongoDB in there as well. It is very much an abstraction away from that concept. Obviously, relational things do leak through. They have to. Foreign keys are in there. But we, lo we like the sort of simplicity um, and, and the way it's designed. And also, back in 2005, there weren't that many other things around. People often forget that. Um, Django is full of sensible abstractions. So one of the things a lot of other places often don't have, or, or perhaps sort of younger frameworks or other frameworks or different languages, um, is the option to sort of opt out of having like database-backed sessions or other things like that. So not only is there a session different backend, so for example, on larger sites, you want your sessions to be in a big something in like memcache, or you want to be in signed cookies, which is even more scalable. Um, caching, there's memcache, there's Redis, there's on file, there's in database, there's all sorts of options for that. Um, email backends, we've just changed, so you don't have to send by SMTP anymore, especially if you're on a local box developing then you may not have SMTP support, your laptop may not know what send mail even is. So the idea of printing to console rather than sending email and things like that is really handy. GeoDjango is one of my favorite parts of Django. Um, it was co-opted into Django only just before the 1.0 release. It used to be a separate project. But for those who aren't familiar with um, geospatial editing, GeoDjango lets you define areas or points or lines so, it can, for example, areas can be um, counties or administrative regions or countries. Lines could be roads, or, and points could be sort of places. Um, and the idea is that you can define models like you usually do. So I can say, here's, here's some lakes. They have a name. Uh, they have a rate, which is their rate of fill. They have a geom, which is their actual polygon. And, they can ha and then the object line is so it knows how to do geospatial queries. And then we can say, get a lake with ID3, and we can then ask for if this lake contains itself, which it does. And not only can you do this, you can define areas. So I could, I could get the polygon of the USA and say, 
tell me all the lakes that are inside this polygon, and then post, post GIS, which is the PostgreSQL scroll um, GIS backend, MySQL has basic support for rectangle ones, and a few other backends can take that query, pass it quite efficiently, and return me quite quickly all the lakes that are inside the USA. Again, you can do it with points, so I can ask for all events that have happened inside London, and it will just give me all the things that are inside that area. It also gives you a very nice admin interface for editing these. So if you're unsure where South Africa is, you can pop up in the, app, the model admin and say, oh, that, that's South Africa. Um, and you can also edit them and pull the points around and various things so you can change what things look like. And it's very useful for testing. Django has some very good debugging tools. So not only do we have manage.py shell, um, for those unfamiliar with that, that launches a Python interactive shell or a REPL inside your Django project. So you can import your models, you can play around with them, you can test out your functions, you can test out your filters, or do all this kind of stuff. Um, we have good testing tools as well. Django has a very strong um, testing community. Um, people are often derided for not doing tests, and there was, in fact, a Django Dash project two years ago um, that I think it was called Django Pants for some reason, that took applications on PyPy, downloaded them, and then, test, and then see how many tests they had and check their coverage. Um, and gave you a rating from A to C, which was quite nice. But Django has quite a lot of testing tools. It has a fake client, so you can do fake requests against your um, application and see what comes back. And so rather than just testing that it returns 200 OK, you can test that if I ask for the page about ponies, it uses a ponies template, it returns the context of the right things in it, all those kind of things. And also, the, the, as I said, the culture of debugging and testing around Django is very good. Not only does core Django have this idea of testing and, you know, uh, and every, every single bug we have must have a test that, that proves it's been fixed, um, but there's also third-party tools for debugging and testing, and things like Django Debug Toolbar, which show you on your site what's been going on. See, the new CSR protection is nice. Um, I had to qualify the new one, because the old one is in my ugly section, as I'll tell you later. Um, so the new CSR protection is very nice. Um, you can do a form, say put a token here, and then a middleware will check automatically all your posts are protected. Um, a quick introduction for those who don't know what CSRF is. If your application has a post view, so if you say if you post here, we'll delete something, um, then evil.com can have a form that posts to the right URL on your site. And if the user's logged in, it can just sort of auto-post that in an iframe in the background and just start deleting stuff over here. So with CSRF, the idea is that you have tokens. And so whenever your site makes a web page, it puts a token in its form so it can prove that the form that's being submitted came from itself. Um, so I'll go a while later, though it's very important that's the case. But the new one is quite nice, and you can turn it off optionally on different parts of the site. The old one has to be on or off globally. The new one, you can say it's on for the admin and off for everywhere else. Auto-escaping. Um, this is a major introduction of Django about 1.0, was the idea that all strings and templates are always escaped um, for HTML inside them, unless you say otherwise. So this, is, this immediately stops a lot of cross-site scripting attacks in, in their footsteps. It's not perfect security design. It won't fix all attacks, but it's it really does help stop a lot of people new to Django or people who are sort of coding in a hurry, have deadlines, um, and it makes you feel safe about your code. You know that if you render this variable, if even it contains a script tag, nothing will happen. It just, just shows script. So that's really handy. And we managed to introduce it in a nice, mostly non -backwards compatible, mostly backwards compatible way. The view API simplicity is something that some of the core committees are very happy about. Um, in Django, a view is just any callable that takes a request and returns a response. It doesn't matter what it is. It can be a function. It can be a class with a call method in Python. It can be something else. Um, but the idea is that anything that does this is fine. So views are traditionally in Django. They're functions. So you just use def. But recently, we started having class-based views. So you can have a view. You can then inherit from it and inherit most of the behavior and use the sub-methods. But you can change little bits of the behavior as well. So if I inherit a list view, I can change sort of the, the query set it uses, or the, the filters it uses for the models, but then get all the other code for free rather than rewriting it in a new function. And this kind of flexibility in Django is very key. Um, we really do like the idea that we're not imposing one particular way on people, but we generally try and push you in the right direction. Python, I think, was a good choice. Obviously, I'm biased here. Um, there are many other good languages as well, but it's, it's, 
you know, compared to something like C or Java, it's a lot easier and quicker to write things in dynamically. Um, I'm sure other known languages are fine, but I like Python, so you know, I'm allowed to do that. Um, multiple database support's very nice. Um, this came in Django 1.2 and was, in fact, um, brought about at the first DjangoCon. Cal Henderson, one of the founders of Flickr, stood on stage and did a talk called Why I Hate Django, which is fantastic. Um, we have a tradition in Django of having talks at conferences of Why I Hate Django. There's one every year. It's very important. Um, and of Cal's points, his major point was that there was no support for more than one database. Um, in Django 1.0, you connect to one database and that was it. There was no support for like, different ones for read, different ones for write. And, it's, and at sites at big scale, you want one database to write to at the master, and then you read from the slaves, and various other different things as well, or sharding by different, um, different kinds of table. And so MultiDB is a very important thing. It's very nicely done. It's not noticeable at all if you're using one database. You'd never know it's there. And as soon as you want it, it, it turns up and you can do things with it. It's not very complex. It's got no built-in support for sharding or any kind of sort of read-write balancing. But the idea is that if you're doing that stuff, you're probably quite large and you can afford to do it correctly yourself. Anything we shipped wouldn't fit for most people. And it's probably, you know, we, we'd rather you do it the right way for you rather than shipping some code that worked all right half the time. We have a very small actual core. You can turn off nearly all of Django, the admin, the authentication, the sessions, all that kind of stuff, and be left with basically just URL resolving and a view handler. Um, not many people do. I've done it once in the past, but it is quite nice that you can turn off bits. Um, the admin especially is useful to turn off if you've gone your own admin. Sessions, useful to turn off if you're doing a stateless website, so you save some render time. Um, internationalization can be turned off if, like me, you do mostly English sites. Um, I do do some internationalization ones. Um, and, you know, it's, it's nice to have that kind of flexibility. And finally, um, documentation, I think, is very important. Uh, we have very good documentation. It's very extensive. It's not that well organized, perhaps, but there's a lot of it there. And there's a, there's a, a culture of documentation. If you submit a bug patch to Django, it will not be accepted until it has documentation for what you've added, if it's any new features, and a test, which means that any new features that get added always have documentation. And in third-party applications, if you don't have that documentation, you're derided. It's a big, strong thing. We like to make sure that people know how to use this stuff. It's, it's all very well having... These, all these cool programs, but unless you know people know what to do with them, you know, it's not very useful. Oh, that wasn't the finally. This is the finally. Um, or possibly not. The community, I think, is very important. Django has a very strong community. We have, we've had three years of conferences now. They keep, they keep getting bigger. We have to keep moving to different hotels and making them bigger. Um, and there's a very strong sense of community. We have lots of third-party applications, lots of people using it, lots of tips. Um, and generally, it's, it, and they're really friendly as well, and it's nice to have a community. And it also means that the core development team can grow bigger, we can get more stuff done, and it can generally be quite, quite good. Django is also not too high level. We don't take one method of doing stuff and impose it. So, I'm, not that I'm saying this is a bad idea, but you know, certain CMSs, things like um, Drupal, for example, impose a certain way of doing things. And in Drupal, you basically you start off with your thing, and you sort of edit down and, and parse, pair away things. In Django, you start at the bottom and you build up. Um, for things you do in Django that aren't necessarily just content sites, this is fine. If you want a content management system, there are ones built on top of Django. But Django is more a framework for general web applications. If you're doing a site that has mapping along with visualizations with some snazzy stuff, then you can sort of build them up and choose the right part from the start. And I think that's really nice. Now, the, the more interesting part, the bad. This is, uh, this is much more interesting. So, the old CSF support was fascinatingly awful. Um, so, as with most bad parts in Django, it used a regular expression. And basically, it looked for the last tag, well, it's not very good here, There's a, the last form tag, the closing form tag in any form. It took that and it replaced it with a CSRF token and the closed form tag, which is all fine. So every form on the page gets a token saying what it is. That's all well and good. However, also, for forms that posted outside the page, say to evil.com, as in this example, it also included the token. Um, this is not good because that means evil.com has a token that's valid for, your, for that user on your site. So they can then take that, post directly back to your site, and do a CSRF attack. And if you're using the admin, that means they can post to 
slash admin slash core slash user slash delete or something, and then start deleting your admin users, or even post their own admin user or various other things. So thankfully, this was got rid of eventually. You can still turn it on. It's called legacy now. There's a very large warning documentation saying, don't do this. It's probably very stupid because you can get attacked by evil sites. But if you don't post outside your sites, like the first people did this didn't, it's fine. Schema changes has always been a problem in Django. Um, in Django, when you make a new model, you run SyncDB, a new table appears, everybody's happy. If you add a new column, if you delete a column, if you change the constraints, Django itself just goes and doesn't do anything. So luckily, I've been fixing this for the last two years by writing an external third-party application called South. There are other ones too, demigrations, um, I forget some of the other ones, uh, Django Evolution, that do the same thing. But I think this was kind of a mission from Django at the start. Adding columns and deleting columns is something I do a lot. Um, my schema doesn't start off fixed in stone. It's sort of, you know, it's, it, it, it presumes you have like a UML diagram and then derive your models from that, whereas I just sort of sit there hacking about models, changing types of fields, adding constraints as I go. So I think the lack of that was a bit bad. Um, the plan is, hopefully, to get some parts of schema changing into, sa into Django in a, f in a release or two releases time, but there's no fixed timeline or feature set for that, so I have to wait and see. <coughs> The template implementation is dodgy. Um, the it, so those of you who've done parsing of languages know that you have a tokenizer and then a, you know, or Alexa and then a parser, basically. Um, Django's tokenizer is two regular expressions and its parser is basically non-existent. It can't cope with any kind of nesting uh, of comments or anything. Um, it's also not very efficient at doing includes. It doesn't compile templates, just interprets them. It's generally quite slow. Um, one of the old big sites that used Django uh, before they went away had about 200 includes in every template page, and the render took about one and a half seconds sometimes. So it's really not brilliant. We've, it's, it's kind of been bolted on and patched around, so there's now a caching template renderer, but that's kind of not really the solution to the problem. There have been discussions of possibly improving it a bit more in, inside, um, but the problem is it's very hard to change while still being 100% backwards compatible. Um, which, of course, for Django is very important because people rely on us not to just change things underneath their feet, and that means they can't upgrade. But hopefully, we'll fix that soon. Ah, the ugly, even better. Magic. Um, Django, when it was first released in 2005, had a lot of magic. You define models, they magically appeared over here in a different namespace where you imported them from. You define template tags, they magically appeared over here. Um, this wasn't particularly good. And people didn't know how things appeared. You couldn't trace them back very easily. If a model just appeared in Django.meta, you had no idea where it came from. And so there was a very popular thing called the magic removal, where all the magic was taken out of Django, well, most of the magic. Um, so these days, it's a lot better. Um, and you can tell where things come from. You can easily trace back areas to where they actually came from, rather than some other module. But that was quite nasty for a while. Too many regular expressions. I, I love regular expressions, but they can get a bit long. So there are several very long regular expressions in the core Django code. The URL resolver has one. Um, it runs on regular expressions, that's probably fine. I'm not sure it should, but we'll, you know, that's, that's general, generally accepted to be all right. Um, but one of our most recent security, fun security vulnerabilities in sort of last, mid last year was a problem with the email regex. So this is our email regex. Um, the top one is vulnerable to a DDoS attack. The bottom one is not vulnerable to a DDoS attack. If you can spot the difference, <laughs> the difference is actually this clause here, which limits the length of this particular query. Um, if you don't have that there, your regular expression engine does backtracking. And the longer the domain string you put in, the longer it takes. Um, if you put three or 400 characters in, the top one would run for several minutes and just die. Uh, so yeah, the, the, the problem is, and we spent a good three or four uh, days on and off trying to work out what the hell was wrong and how to fix this um, because it's not particularly editable. Um, but yes, so I, I, I personally think we should have for an email validation, does the string contain at? Yes, it's probably an email. Because um, you know, we, we can't test whether there actually isn't a valid email at the other end of that address. Let's just test whether it looks like one. And most users, you know, most errors are going to be typing usernames in there or web addresses and I just think 
getting this kind of checking is a bit excessive. Also, it only allows the main TLDs that are six characters long. So if you have, so dot .museum is fine, but if you invent a seven-letter one, all the old versions of Django aren't going to work. So, yeah, not brilliant. Auth is a bug, another big bugbear of mine. This is like a personal vendetta thing now. Um, so Auth inside Django is fixed. Um, so it's fixed to having a first name and a last name, which is already stupid for internalization. You know, first name and last name is a very, is not, is a very Western thing to start with. Um, it's fixed to having a single email address and a password. Uh, the email address is required, as is the password. Um, and it's also fixed to having a few other attributes. And you can't change this. You can't go to Django and go, I also want an age field, or I also want a, a URL of a website field. You have to make a different model and link it in. Um, and there's no way of getting rid of auth and doing your own one without completely removing it, because you can remove it, and making your own one, and then replicating all the same API, or writing all your own code that uses a different API. And there's been some discussion about how to make this better. Um, there's been the idea of extendable models, but you know, doing that in a way that's not crazy is very difficult. We don't want much crazy. Crazy is bad. So it's a difficult problem, and it, it's a bit ugly, because you end up with these one-to-one -one relationships that really should be one table of like a profile model. And there's even a hack where you say, this is my profile model, and Django adds special shortcuts to get it from a user. But it's just a workaround of the problem. Um, the old template language was fascinating. So rather than having an if tag, that just did, you know, equality, less than, greater than. Nah, that was bad. The if tag just did Boolean testing. It took one variable. If you want to do equals, there was an if equal tag. That's fine, right? You know, if equal A, B. If you want to do not equal to, you have to do if not equal. And in Django, every tag ends with an end tag name. And so if you want to do lots of negation, negated equal expressions, your code would turn out littered with ends if not equal, which is not the best way to do ifs. Um, thankfully, in 1.2, we introduced... 1.3? 1.2. We introduced smart if, which actually do such modern things as double equals and equals and less than and things like that. But this is a site, you know, the template language shouldn't have that much logic, but I think that's going a bit too far. But the question thing here is, you know, Django has a lot of problems. We've had a lot of them and we've solved a lot of them as well. Are there lessons to be learned here? Not really. Uh, when Django was initially released, it had a very different purpose to what it does now. It was designed for a few websites in-house. It worked fine for those. Um, and in fact, it worked well enough that people were impressed by it and really, you know, really got um, <coughs> infused by how good it was. But I think every framework and every software application develops over time. And you get the horrible bits of code and regular expressions that you can't debug lying around. But I think in general, you know, you have to realize that for a project, not everything needs fixing now. I know a lot of people who just sit there and refuse to release software, software until it's perfect. Software is never perfect. I think, I think we all know that. Um, open source software is never done. And if we sat there and didn't release until all those problems I've decided to be fixed, Django 1.0 would still wouldn't have happened five, six years later. So, you know, it's one of those things. Um, and I, you know, from what I've seen for the last three years, you improve by being consistent, sometimes even at the expense of being a little ugly or a little bad. In the end, yes, template language is ugly, but it's been the same for three or four years, and you can still use it, and your application is still mostly run. Um, don't get carried away by, by writing new features. We got carried away for a while. That was bad. Um, lots of bugs piled up. We're fixing that now. But yes, new features are great, but they're only great if the old ones still work at the same time. And also, um, people with lots of free time. It's very handy for an open source project. Um, we, for a while, Django had a bit of a lack of work resources. But thankfully, it's been mostly improved now. But don't, you know, never underestimate the amount of developers and resources you need. Especially if, think, if you think you're all right. Remember that it takes a few months or a few years to bring new people into the fold and get them up to speed. And by the time you get there, you may realize you've been a bit too late. So, thank you for that. I hope you've learned something from this. If not, then I'm sorry. <laughs> um, can, uh, feel free to ask any questions. I'm happy to defend my position, and thank you very much. <laughs> any questions? Um, so, uh, quite old, like, uh, I think it's 0.96. Is there any 
Okay, so the question was, Google App Engine is using a very old version of Django, which is 0.96. Is there any communication with them to try and fix that? There has been a bit. Um, with the App Engine, you can, thankfully, these days, you can get your own version of Django in there by zipping it up and fixing it in. Um, some people have tried to poke them. They haven't done very much. App Engine doesn't seem to be... Um, it seems to be sort of a bit of a... They've, they only started doing new features again, so I'm not sure what the state of that is, but I think they've just left it in there because... Just because. I mean, these days, I think they recommend do your own Django, so. Well, thank you very much.